I've been alienated. Get it? Alienation. In its most basic sense, alienation is a term to describe a problematic separation of things. I cannot keep these on. I'm sorry, I've ruined the illusion. Shattered. You all thought it was a real alien, didn't you? But no, it's me. If you're politically alienated, that means that you feel unrepresented by politics. If you can imagine such a thing. If you're socially alienated, it means you've got no friends. You're a proper Billy No Mates. I'm allowed to make those jokes, because... Um... <laughs> what with so many books out there, and with so many of them being hefty boys like this, how on earth are we supposed to know on which books we should spend our valuable time? Oh. The blurb on the back often isn't too informative, and we all know that judging them based on their covers is illegal. Well, if you're looking to do more reading but aren't sure where to start, then today's sponsor, Blinkist, might be the app for you. Blinkist allows you to get a good understanding of the key concepts of over 6,500 non-fiction titles. Within 15 minutes, you can be sure whether a book is worth your time by enjoying easy-to-follow Blinks, which are available in English, German and Spanish. You can either listen to the incredibly soothing audio versions or read them, if that's your thing. See? Words. And talking. You can create collections and download them to your device. As well as all the non-fiction Blinks, you can also find classic works of literature, short podcast episodes, and get great deals on audiobooks. One of the coolest features is this new Spaces tab, which you can use to share resources with friends, family, and networks. This brand new feature can be used for groups of people or for topics like politics and feminism. They're extremely easy to set up. Just tap on the Spaces icon at the bottom right of the screen, tap Create Space, think up a cool and jazzy name, add titles, and invite people. It literally could not be easier. I've already been busy exploring and I genuinely like it. I listened to the blink of Karl Marx's Capital as a little refresher for this video. I listened to a very interesting podcast on restorative justice and why we need to quote, uplift our cultural standards of what is possible. So I recommend that one. And look, I've already started my first space. I just need some friends to share it with. So if you like the look of Blinkist, then today is your lucky day. They have been kind enough to give me a handy little link to live in the description box. A link which, if you click it, will give you 25% off your annual premium membership and a seven day free trial. So if you're looking to do more reading, but you don't know where to start, then get Blinkist via the link in the description box today. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. If you have a sense of disconnect from something which is important to you, that's alienation, up to its old tricks. If you hear leftists talking about how we're being alienated under capitalism, then chances are they're referring to Karl Marx, who said that we're being alienated in four whole ways. Firstly, workers are alienated from the products of their labour, meaning that those who make the stuff don't get to profit off the stuff, and probably also can't even afford to buy the stuff. Secondly, workers are alienated from the modes of production, meaning that they have no control over the material conditions in which they work. How the factory or spaceship or whatever is being run how labour is divided or the practices of the company, how much is being wasted or polluted or any anything. Thirdly, we are alienated from our Gattungswesen, obviously. I mean, that goes without saying, doesn't it? Fourthly, we are alienated from each other. Gattungswesen. This is Editing Mika, here to say that literally 
every single time I make a video where I mention this concept, I ask my German partner how I properly pronounce this word. And every single time I mess it up when it comes to recording the video. So it's Gattungswesen, not Wesen, not Wesen, Wesen, Gattungswesen, Gattungswesen, Wesen, 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 Gattungswesen, so Gattungs, Gattungswesen, Wesen. And can be roughly translated into species essence. And that then typically gets translated again into human nature which then gives philosophers something to nitpick and problematize. At least it keeps them off the streets. Because then they get to go, oh, oh, it's an argument from human nature and we all know they're silly. One of the main criticisms of Marx's theory of alienation is in fact this, that he's basically going, there is some idealized way that humans ought to be and capitalism is preventing them from achieving this destiny much in the same way that romantic thinkers used to do. You know, like your Russos, who thought there was some innocent and natural free social selves that society has corrupted, which is Eurocentric silliness. But that's not what Marx is saying. The only thing that Marx ever really argued could be thought of as a species essence was our capacity for creativity and our tendency to build upon what came before. I don't know that Marx ever really argued that these things were like preordained in the way that people who usually make essentialist arguments from human nature do, rather than it's just like a thing that seems to be the case. We like to create, to explore, to problem solve and build. Who knows why? Who cares why, to be honest? And Marx is saying that we are being alienated by capitalism from the means by which we can do those things. Remember, capitalism is essentially an economic system in which some people own stuff for a living and most people work for those people for a living. And so very materially and literally, by definition, our creative and autonomous capacities are limited and alienated from us. And so is our capacity for collaboration, given that the fourth and final form of Marxist alienation is alienation of workers from each other. By the division of labour physically separating workers, the class division which capitalism has exacerbated, or by the competition between workers for jobs and resources. Because obviously, if you have an economic system which, by definition, means that you have to have most people working for fewer people, then you need to keep most people needing to work for those people. Everyone cannot succeed under capitalism. Equality can never be under capitalism. That would render it not capitalism anymore. Marx said, The worker, therefore, feels himself at home only during his leisure time, whereas at work, he feels homeless. But I'm here to tell you, that not only are we being alienated at leisure, but all the time, awake and asleep, from birth until death. Sounds scary. But if we take alienation to mean not being able to do whatever you want, then it isn't really, is it? Peter Railton argued something similar, saying that the demands of morality will always result in a kind of alienation situations where we might feel like we want to do a thing but we don't because consequences so is that right is a bit of alienation fine then had the marxists best pipe down while well, modern alienation theories focus on our ability to fulfill our own desires and not just the potentially unethical ones they focus on the relationship between the self and self-determination and that's what i'm interested in how able we are to even recognize, let alone fulfill our own desires. And what, dear viewer, if the desires we think we have are themselves a result of alienation? What if we're being alienated from our feelings, our memories, our personalities, our very identities? It wouldn't be great, would it? Personal identity. Personal identity is constructed, ever-changing. 
both in ways you control and ways you do not. To illustrate what I mean on that, let's have a look at what the philosophers have philosophed on the matter, because boy, have they philosophed. Take, for example, the continuity theories of personal identity. Continuity theories of personal identity branch into bodily and psychological continuity. So like, bodily continuity is basically going, We have the same body over time, so that's us having an identity. And if you're very clever, Abigail, please don't sue me. You'll be thinking, well, that's a load of bollocks, isn't it? Clearly, our bodies changed a great deal over time. I used to be a baby. And you'd be correct. You did used to be a baby. See how easy it is to do philosophy. Really though, at a pretty fundamental level, you literally do not have the same body that you did have or will have in the future. So bodily continuity, no. Psychological continuity is a little bit more complex than that, but still, no. It focuses on memory and awareness of experience, which is still pretty dodgy as we're literally not conscious for a good chunk of our lives. Also, people forget stuff. Memories can and are easily manipulated. So no, our psychology is not continuous in that sense. I made a whole video back in the day about no self theories and why I like them. It's old. I cringe, but it's still up, so fill your boots. Buddhist conceptions of self are along the lines of a no-self theory. So it is an idea that has existed for a few thousand years and is held by quite a few people. And Western philosopher and alleged Buddha fan slash plagiarizer David Hume articulated a no-self theory of his own, commonly known as the bundle theory of self. So right, Hume was like kind of obsessed with the fact that the great minds of the world were constantly going on about how they know things, when in reality what they were doing was making fairly educated guesses. He said that we love to imagine imaginary connections between things which don't really exist. That we never really perceive the mechanism of cause and effect. What we experience is one thing following on from another. He said that we attribute qualities to perceptions in order for them to make sense to us, but that these qualities are not really belonging to those perceptions. On personal identity, he talked about all the different things that make you up as a person. That's his bundle theory of self in a nutshell, right? There's loads of things about you. There's thousands of things that make you, you. I like to call those things aspects of self. Your body, sure. Your psychology, your trauma, your tastes, the things that give you pleasure and pain. Your memories and dreams, the way you act and think. Your sexuality, your gender, your relationships with others, the things you do. The clothes you wear, your perceptions, intuitions and needs. All of it combined is your identity. And it's not static over time. All of it is in constant change. And also... Identity is nothing really belonging to these different perceptions. But it's merely a quality which we attribute to them because of the union of their ideas in the imagination when we reflect on them. He's saying there's no underneath that tying it together over time. You're just a pile of stuff. But when Hume said that your identity is just the union of the ideas in the imagination when you reflect upon them, he hit on more than he knew. Because that's literally how our brains work. That is genuinely how we experience and understand the world and survive within it. As proved by science. Science. You know brains? You familiar? Well, unless you're some kind of religious, most people agree that our consciousness is pretty brain-based. How your brain is, is gonna be a pretty big part of your identity. So these brains, right? How do they work? What are they up to? What are they even here for? In the most basic sense, your brain is there to keep you alive. To make sure all the necessary life-giving things get done. 
It is the overworked and underappreciated housewife of the body, and like overworked and underappreciated housewives, it has to predict the needs of everyone, I mean thing else. Predicting stuff to keep you alive is what they are all about. It's their whole entire vibe. And they do this by smooshing together all the sense data, all the info they're getting from the ears, eyes, and the, the rest of the sense gang as well as all your previous experience and memories, together with the concepts you have learned along the way. It smooshes all this together super quick and predicts what's about to immediately happen and issues signals accordingly. It's doing this all the time, super speedy, and sometimes it gets stuff wrong. That's how you get things like seeing the wrong colour of a dress, or failing to see what is being shown in a grainy image until you're shown what's there or thinking that that shadow that you saw is definitely a ghost and you've already sprinted down the street before you've realised that it was probably your cat. Your mind plays tricks on you, or rather you've messed with your brain's predictive abilities with too many movies. Brains are great at their jobs, but they're not infallible. As much as minds can play tricks on us, we can play tricks on them. In my video about emotions, I explained how emotions are constructed based on our interoception and affect, so that's basically how we feel inside, the actual context of the situation, and the emotional concepts we have learned. I explained how through conceptual blindness, if we didn't have the words to describe complex emotions, we wouldn't be able to experience them. And did you know, right, that in the 50s or the 60s, some scientists called Hubel und Wiesel, Hubel und Wiesel, I, I don't actually know if they're German, but they should be. So they did experiments on kittens where they raised groups of kittens in environments consisting of only either horizontal or vertical lines, right? So like one group of kittens lived in an environment of only vertical lines. So all of their cages had vertical lines only. All the people that went in there to feed them were like dressed in vertical stripy suits, vertical stripy wallpaper, painted everything, you, you get it. And then horizontal for the other group. And when they were let out into the normal world, these kittens were literally blind to the type of line they hadn't experienced. The vertical cohort were falling off edges, and the horizontal gang, they were walking face first into table legs. <laughs> it's not funny. But the conclusion drawn was that the visual cortex needs access to imagery if the brain is going to make sense of it. And on one hand, that makes perfect sense, right? If we understand all the things I've just said about how brains work, then that almost goes without saying. But on the other hand, it's shocking, isn't it? Because we kind of like to think that we're experiencing the world directly that there's a real reality out there which we can observe one for one. There's loads of philosophy on this. Isms and ologies with really long names. Phenomenology. Epistemology. Ontology even. Our experiences of the world are absolutely not unfiltered, direct, one for one. You don't need to be a philosopher to know that. And how we experience the world directly impacts our motivations, our thought processes, our behaviours, our emotions, and our moral beliefs. In short, our experiences and acquired concepts shape our identities. Jesus Christ! It's a statement of the obvious, isn't it? Oh yeah, Jesus is real, actually, by the way. He lives up here in space. How did it take you so long to get there? Our experiences shape our identities. I am very clever. Yeah. Well, I, I remember the, the alienation and the, this, this bad, this, the capitalism. I am saying something, I swear. I know you all intuit this, I know I'm not exactly breaking new ground here, but I want us all to properly think about the mechanisms here. I want us to be well versed in how deep this goes. Fine. 
I'm sure by now we're aware that our memories can be easily manipulated. When you remember an event, you aren't really remembering the event, rather you're remembering the last time you remembered the event. And each time you remember it, any kind of environmental or emotional or any impact can change the way you remember it the next time. This is how cops can convince witnesses and suspects that they remembered things slightly different, or how whitewashing of historical events can occur over time with enough propaganda, but also how talk therapy works to relieve trauma. Thinking back on a traumatic memory in a safe and comfortable environment can make the memory a little less triggering the next time you think back on it. This process repeated over time in a safe, comfortable and controlled way, while maybe not making you feel any differently about the event, it can make the occurrence of the memory less physically upsetting for your nervous system. The way we interpret our own feelings can be a pretty dicey affair too, you know. Did you know that judges pass harsher sentences before lunch? They get hangry and blame it on the defendant. <laughs> Studies have shown that public opinion of an event can be greatly influenced by the language used to describe it. Slightly more violent or sensationalist language can really impact people's perceptions and moral judgments. We all like to think that we make our political and moral judgments based on the information at hand and holding impeccable moral vibes but every fibre of our being is exposed to being changed and manipulated in ways that we would never choose. Physical health. Stress is a killer. We know this. But why is it? Stress involves a spike in cortisol levels, which is very good for you if you're in a survival situation. It allows you to get shit done. Make those decisions to get yourself away from whatever it is that's threatening your life. But prolonged periods of high cortisol, as we see with chronic stress, that can lead to inflammation. And inflammation, that's what will get you. Inflammation can and does lead to multitudes of painful, debilitating and even dangerous life-threatening conditions. It's no joke. You probably know somebody with an inflammatory condition which gives them a lot of grief if you don't have one yourself. And physical distress begets more stress, which then only leads to more hormonal clusterfucks. Things are pretty stressful these days, aren't they? We were promised that technological advances would make life easier and stress-free. But what actually happens is everyone takes their work home with them. We are constantly updated on the horrors of the world by these stress boxes, and we are fully aware of what will likely be our pretty imminent demise if we don't do something pretty radical and likely stressful right the heck now. The alienating aspects of this world are increasing. They are always there and their demands are more intrusive than ever. Man is himself only at leisure, said Marx. But unless you live in a country like Germany where there's laws against employers contacting their staff out of hours, then there isn't really often a fixed end to the working day anymore. But that's also why, with this increase in work from home, younger workers are learning to be a lot more firmer with their boundaries. Making sure to stop work when you stop being paid. And rejecting the idea that to succeed means to sacrifice all of your free time. Here we have an example of both how easily our free time can slip away from us, how easily capitalist alienation can slither into our lives, how capital will always try to take more and more from us, but also what we can do about it. The anti-work movement taking off among younger millennial and Gen Z workers, the passionate drives towards unionization, all the strikes, the willingness of those who can to stand up to bosses, to quiet or angry quit when pushed too far, to expose their employers for exploitation, nepotism and toxicity, to reject the demands for emotional labour, to proudly say, I do not care about this company. 
I'm here for the money. You are a means to pay rent and nothing more. I love to see it. And it's not just work, is it? As you've said, we've got these stress boxes. And this is absolutely not a phone bad thing. I could never. But you remember all that about stress being a killer and how chronic stress can lead to chronic and even fatal health conditions. To live in fear will, in all likelihood, mean a shorter life. Hairbrush. Governments use fear to control their citizens. Sensationalist media uses fear to drive engagement. Political bad actors use fear to deflect blame from themselves. Corporations use fear to keep their employees submissive. And then there's all the genuinely frightening shit going on too, like the climate crisis, international tensions, or the current attacks on fundamental rights like healthcare and freedom of expression. Remember, your brain is a squishy, wet ball of electricity that lives in a completely dark box. And it is completely reliant on sense data to make sense of what the hell's going on and issue predictions accordingly to keep you alive. And what with all the technology these days? Adverts and political messaging is highly targeted. You're not getting the same feeds as other people. We're being alienated from each other in that way too. There's epistemological alienation going on. Targeted messaging is aimed to touch you personally, to show you what it thinks you will respond to most, what you most enjoy and fear. It's like the cave in Star Wars, if the cave in Star Wars was being run by a predictive algorithm which was trying to get Luke to vote Republican. Oh my god, and you're like, in a cave too? Because echo chambers? That's a perfect analogy. But there's another aspect too. The social part of social media. If you've got any kind of online presence, then you're opening yourself up to thousands, if not millions of people. Strangers who absolutely are going to have opinions about you. And it can, of course, get a lot more dangerous than opinions. Death threats, doxing, actual people turning up in real life, swatting for fuck's sake. Around 40% of teenagers have experienced online bullying, and for LGBTQ plus teens, that number rises to over half. I had to worry about my bullies waiting for me at the school gates, and I would often take evasive measures to avoid them. But kids today have it all the time in their pockets. Their bullies can follow them home and no one would even know about it. And that's obviously not mentioning the other kinds of dangers awaiting kids online. Again, this is not a phones bad thing. This is very much a people bad thing. This is a we need regulations and oversight and a great deal more literacy education thing. This is a we need to make fascists afraid to speak publicly thing. This is a seize the means of phones thing. Fear, a constant sense of being at risk. The presence of potential or actual dangers just there, all the time. Sounds stressful, IMO. So our health's fucked, but what about our identity? In the personal sense. Because that same targeted messaging might not just be triggering unnecessary fear responses. It might be shaping the way you perceive the world. We're each shown a custom view of the world, so interpersonal dissonance is inevitable. You can start to form quite unique views of what are essentially collectivist problems. And of course, that in itself is not always a bad thing, and of course there are things you can do about it. This isn't a, they're brainwashing you with phones bit, it's just code, it's just algorithms. There are plenty of things that you can do to shape your online world. Echo chambers aren't inevitable, but they certainly are the case currently for most users of social media. But honestly, recognising the problem is a good step towards fixing it. But online is, and I believe will continue to be, a big part of our lives. There's no getting away from it. People can act like it's a choice for teens to have smartphones, but it isn't really. 
I think we all know that it isn't. You're not going to function well in today's society without internet access and probably also a smartphone. And to expect people to cut them off from what might be their only access to the outside world, their only opportunity to be themselves, their only way to earn money, that's a pretty big ask. I remember reading some articles in like businessy magazines about how employers see no social media presence as a red flag when hiring people. Same goes for dating. People don't feel comfy if they can't check you out a bit first. And obviously, friendship groups and families can be spread out all over the place. You're not going to get people to give up being able to video call their grandkids. It's really silly to pretend like the only way to solve the problems of online worlds is to encourage people to log off and put their phones down. I'd prefer that we focus on the arseholes who are exploiting, manipulating and hurting people in order to protect their own slice of power or to make sales. And importantly, working on providing alternatives. But with an online presence inevitably comes some kind of alienation. You can't be yourself warts and all. You kind of have to care what other people think, don't you? The only people who feel that they can be fully and openly themselves online are the people who already hold all the power and privilege that they're ever going to get. I'm sure all this talk of not being able to be yourself is making a lot of you out there think of autistic masking, but rather than give that an honourable mention in today's video, I think I'd rather dedicate a whole video to alienation and masking. But if you remember back to that bundle theory of identity and our aspects of self, well our online experience our profiles and interactions, together with all that targeted messaging. It's all adding stuff to our aspects of self. It's filling up our bundles. It's adapting the way we do things. It's changing our experience of the world and therefore our identities. And again, this doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing. It's not bad when experiences change you. That's just existence. But when our online spaces are being used in nefarious ways, both to alienate us in the ways that Marx talked about, but also to breed hate and grow fascism, to con and swindle, to create new geopolitical realities, to stress kids to the point of breakdown, to make people live in fear of imaginary monsters, often in ways we don't even think about, let alone have any control or autonomy over. Well, I'd say that that amounts to further removing us from control of our personal identities. Mark said that we're ourselves only at leisure time, but you are making sure to monetize your leisure time, right? Marx actually did fail to consider the gig economy and online revenue. Not really his fault in 1860s, but still. The pressure to monetize your hobbies, rendering them no longer hobbies, or to rent out your free time on a freelance basis, making it no longer free time. Keeping up an online presence while your employers also expect you to be reachable 24 seven. And like, you are upskilling, right? After all, you'll probably need 10 years experience and a master's degree for an entry level position in a few years time. A minimum wage job in hospitality and retail requires you to spend hours filling out complex forms, role play simulators, personality tests designed to trick you into betraying any negative traits. Traits like independence and a sense of autonomy. So I do hope that you're brushing up on how to fool them. You can't let the algorithm see the real you. There's a type of person you need to convincingly pretend to be. You know, so you can apply for a position which might not even exist, you know, because HR companies like to post fake job adverts to make it seem like the company's growing. Where even is this leisure time, Carl? It's gone. They took it. And what tools are we being given to cope with it? Self-help that tells us to just change our outlook and think differently. That if we're in a bad spot, we probably only have ourselves to blame. Have you tried meditating? Or overhauling your whole diet? Or, oh, fasting. Maybe a new look would perk yourself up. What is your colour season? And by the way, is there any reason why you're not out jogging right now? 
Did you know that Celeb McRitchface gets up at 5am every day to pick fresh tail for the day's smoothies? Have you tried Marie Kondoing your own? It can really help to clear the mind or, oh, oh, better yet, purchased more stuff. There are some real nifty little gadgets out there that can really take the stress out of housework, leaving you more time to build your skill set. Do you ever feel like you're just being pulled in a million different directions while the ticking clock that is your life just keeps getting louder and louder and louder? Just me? Far from it. Have you seen those calendars where it's supposed to be like your whole life split into days and then you can tick off the days as you get closer to death? It's genuinely supposed to be motivational. I think that would honestly send me into a dangerous depressive spiral. I'm physically disabled and have a great deal of chronic pain. There are so many days where I cannot do as much as I would like. And it has been a real struggle of a journey to be okay with that. Without having my limited time on this planet staring me directly in the face. All right, I think we should wrap this up. This anti-capitalist rant could go on with no end. To summarize in a proper philosopher way, our affect and learned concepts determine our actions and mental activity through neurological wiring. Two, the concepts we hold with which our brain makes sense of affect and sense data are being manipulated both by benign environmental factors and also purposefully by bad actors. Three, we are being alienated from the concepts we can access and therefore hold. And also, four, being purposefully alienated from the concepts you can hold necessarily means being alienated from our aspects of self. But also, five, being physically harmed at a cellular level by the stresses imposed by those same alienating mechanisms in ways which we might not even be cognizant of, that also alienates us from control over our own health. There are other ways that we are being alienated from control over our own health as well, of course. Just off the top of my head, for example, if you live in a food desert, but how we conceptualize our world and all the stuff therein is so important. And if you're extra super duper incredibly clever, then you'll know that I'm relying quite heavily on the work of Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. Hey, I nailed it. I thought I'd be like... <laughs> <laughs> Who you should all read. She's that widely acclaimed and much cited scientist who Geordie Beep Eperson once called some random columnist. Darwin was wrong, but some random columnist for Scientific American is right? Probability? Zero. More woke idiocy and thinly veiled Marxist criticism of essentialism masquerading as enlightened science. I want to be clear. I don't see alienation as something one is or is not. I think, as I mentioned before, that there will always be some degree of alienation at play, and that rather it should be thought of in terms of degree. There probably is some level of alienation or lack of autonomy that we are absolutely fine with. In fact, there definitely is, because free will is not universal. And we tend to accept that some level of sacrifice is absolutely fine, so long as it's for reasons which we agree are good, like the so-called confines of morality. So if you want to come into the comments like I'm saying that without capitalism we'd have control over all of this stuff then, go ahead, but you're gonna look very silly in my eyes. So much of our being is shaped by the concepts we hold and how we have learned to relate different concepts together. As Barrett says, Every human being is the sum of their concepts, which become the predictions that drive behavior. Your concepts shape how you perceive the world, how you experience life. The concepts in your head are not purely a matter of personal choice, 
but we do still have some choice. We can shape our concepts intentionally. We can learn new ones and new ways of relating them. We can learn, and by learning, we actively restructure our brains. The biological mechanisms by which we are being alienated are the same mechanisms by which we will free ourselves. This is not a magical fix and it is certainly not believing things better. But by understanding how deeply we are being shaped, we can start to resist. Just like trauma therapy, it doesn't happen quickly. We are immersed in alienation and the ones that we have to resist have all the resources. And we have a limited time on this earth, but our capacity as humans, as a collective, is far less limited. Dr. Barrett talks about granularity of concepts. I really dig this. She thinks it's very important. And I agree. The right, they love to simplify, don't they? Everything's this or that. It's all a binary. <laughs> there are simple solutions to complex problems. There's a good way to be and a bad way to be. We figured everything out a couple of hundred years ago and we just need to conserve it. But complexity, detail, nuance, different angles, more words, more concepts, more ways of being, understanding and accepting the fluidity and variation of existence, allowing people to form more and more neural connections. That's how we figure this shit out. And by doing a bit of a Descartes every now and then, having a bit of a conceptual Marie Kondo, take a bit of time to have a think, if you can. Have a little examine of the concepts you hold. Do they still stand up? Do they still spark joy? Taking some ownership of yourself at an epistemological fundamental level and create, create the concepts you wish to see in the world. This is why representation is important. Kids being able to conceptualize themselves doing different things is life-changing. That can be the difference between them doing the thing or not doing the thing. How many times have you heard like, the first female whatever to do a thing, say like, before she tried it, she thought that girls just could not do that. And how many girls came before her just thinking it was impossible, so not even trying. Or like, how many times have you heard somebody who has changed their mind on something, say something like, oh yeah, I had heard the opposing view before, but it was only when this thing happened or when that person said it in that way that it really clicked. Like some moment where all the pieces just fell into place. And these conceptual internal changes obviously breed real world external changes. People behave differently when their concepts change. People experience things differently when our concepts change. Culture changes when concepts do. This isn't idealism versus materialism, it's both. Brains are material shaped by our environment and our environment is shaped by the people brains in it. I mean, if we really want a chicken and egg it, then materialism wins. But still, language shapes reality and reality shapes language, but we can decide things. We can make choices. That's the thing about us, said Marx, that we can look at what was and decide what will be. That's power. Variety and repetition. People who study memory loss say that if you have more neurological pathways to a piece of information, then you're less likely to forget it. So, for example, if you want to remember Star of Xena Warrior Princess Lucy Lawless, then you're going to have to think of her as more than just Star of Xena Warrior Princess Lucy Lawless. 
You'll want to also remember that she starred as Rizzo in a Broadway production of Grease in the 90s, that she fractured her pelvis filming an episode of The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, that she has been awarded Ally of the Year at the Australian LGBTI award ceremony. You're going to want to remember that she's a musician and a composer who composed several pieces of music that were actually used in the TV show Xena Warrior Princess, that the character of Xena almost had a planet named after her, turned out not to be a planet though. And please also don't forget that Lucy was arrested and convicted of trespassing after occupying an oil drilling ship for 77 hours and had to serve 120 hours community service. There's a reason why the right and corporations are so keen on the idea of telling them a story. Because when stuff is woven into a coherent narrative, you are more inclined to remember it. Think of the memory palace. That's the technique that people use if they want to remember really long strings of information. So the technique involves you imagining being in a space like a building of some kind that you know well and you walk around the different rooms and you place the items in the room. This creates a visual narrative for your brain to remember rather than trying to remember each individual thing. Narratives invoke all kinds of thoughts and memories, emotions and feelings. You can place yourselves within them. And all of this aids memory because it creates more access points to the information. I think the left need to get better at telling stories. I feel like because we usually have facts and ethics on our side that we feel like that should be enough. Like if we can just show people that their lives would be better if they ditch all the right wing stuff, then they will. But motivation is more complex than that. And the right have spun their narrative. The story of how innovation didn't even exist before a couple of hundred years ago. The tale of how terrible everyone's lives were before the revolution of industry. Stories of our dominance over nature, of the great men whose great minds did great things. As a content creator, I sometimes worry that all of my takes must be hot. All of my thoughts original. Oh no, someone else already made a video essay about this. Oh, that's silly. What we need is repetition. The same things being said in as many different ways as possible. In ways that reach as many different kinds of people as possible. Meet people where they are isn't just some cutesy piece of advice. It's kind of necessary if you want people to understand what the heck you're saying to them. Editing Mika here with a quick caveat to say that that doesn't mean be bigoted if you're talking to a bigot. Just in light of some recent discourse where people seem to be um, suggesting that that's actually what you need to do. You don't. It just means that sometimes you have to explain stuff or use simpler language or give examples that people can use so that people can place themselves within concepts. This isn't about watering down your ideas in any way at all. It's all just about how to effectively communicate. Because we need access to the concepts in order to have the experience. And our concepts have been prone to manipulation, both benign and malicious since birth. Our brains have literally physically formed to incorporate propaganda. And that takes more undoing than someone just telling you you're wrong. And I think we have better stories to tell. We have the best stories, beautiful stories. Our stories aren't static in time either, like those stories of essentialism in human nature or those that preach the end of history. Ours are fluid and real and tangible and come with community. Not individualization, not a feeling that nothing can be done. Our stories are empowering. Our stories are of solidarity and connection, of belief in better things, of the little guy standing up to power, of freedom for all, equality and autonomy. Our stories show you the power you possess, not the power to work yourself ragged in the vague hope that you'll win a rat race but the power to take control right now, to have an impact right now. Our stories are the never-ending story and you are Bastion.
yeah, there's a big bad, but the biggest bad is the belief that nothing can be done. And to defeat it, we need to call out, to shout the names of that which can defeat it. Solidarity, compassion, organization, another perfect analogy. Absolutely flawless. And Falcor, he's obviously worker unions and grassroots organizations. The vehicle by which we take control. Flawless. I've said before that we're at the throw everything at it stage of resistance, but I hope that at least when it comes to changing minds, onboarding the unconvinced, that I've helped us understand the very physical mechanisms which both pose a huge challenge while also being the way that we can overcome. By never ever shutting up, Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video.